they were always surrounded by the most exotic looking people, like an incredible string band concert. These people you'd never seen in your life would, would come out the woodwork. You think, where the, where do they live? People in velvet clothes, with big lacy collars, people who look like Charles I. I mean, Christ, what do they do during the day? Are they under the bed? Waiting for an incredible string band or Grateful Dead concerts to come to town. Crushed velvet people. My name is Robin Williamson, genius of this parish. How do you do? My name is Mike Herron. I come from Edinburgh. And I'm very pleased to meet you all. If you answer this riddle, you'll never begin. I thought, oh, my God, this, these are the people I've been looking for. You know, I was creeping around in cowboy boots, as I still do. <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to be hairy and exotic and interesting. And there they were. And here they are together again. 23 years after they last played together, Robin Williamson and Mike Herron at a sell-out concert. So we thought we'd start off with a song we used to do a long time ago. The Incredible String Band were, without doubt, one of the most innovative bands of the 1960s. Their unique fusion of folk and rock blazed a trail through the psychedelic 60s to Woodstock and beyond. A list of their admirers reads like a roll call for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin. Who's that knocking on my door? Can't see no one right now. Got my baby here by me. Can't stop, no, no, not now. Oh, come, come a little closer to my breast. Many in this audience were from a core group of loyal fans who, through the years of separation, have kept the faith and wouldn't have missed this for the world. And Robin came out, and he's like a god. But then, of course, when he spoke, it was so down to earth and very, very nice. And very, it was pretentious. But it's, it's really nice to be here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you know. And uh, it'd be really nice if you just sort of maybe turned to the person next to you and said hi. And I remember what did. Hi. Hi. So we're all bonding, you know. And for a moment, and that sound, and it is pretentious. It's dead corny. And did it work? you to your face. When you turn to go, but I see They're part of my life, part of a very happy time. Mick and I liked them very much. Um, in that period, whenever it was, sort of 67, 68, that sort of bit, that was the first time I heard anybody sound like that. I don't know, it was a charming, charming time. I felt they'd made that record just for me. <laughs> First girl I loved Time has come, I will sing it this sad goodbye song When I Robert Plant, I interviewed him once and um, he said that when Led Zeppelin started, he and Jimmy Page were obviously great folk uh, enthusiasts and Led Zeppelin are just as much a folk group as they were a blues group. Um, so they'd simply bought a copy of The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter and, and then simply followed the instructions. Oh, the I suppose people now would say it was like psychedelic folk rock, but we never really thought of that. You know, we were just doing what we fancied doing, and it and it just got drawn into what was acceptable for the times. You know, and it became that part of a movement of some kind. If you play two notes that are quite close together on a keyboard, you'll find that they set off a very a very high. Uh... Uh, vibration that so they sort of knock against each other and, and me and Mike you know used to work that way because we came from such totally different points of view Early in the 60s, Robin had started doing the rounds of Scotland's folk clubs and pubs. In 65, he got together with banjo player Clive Palmer. The duo became a, a trio when joined by guitarist Mike Heron. Soon they were playing at Clive's incredible folk club. Well, can then have described as a, an all-night shabine, really, in uh, 
in the top floor of a disused a, a, a department store in Surrey Hall Street, where you used to start at midnight on a Saturday night and run until 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning. You got into an elevator and uh, there was no stairs up to it, so it couldn't get fire brigade permission. You had to, so it was illegal. It was a real sweat box and it was brilliant. My pocket's empty, baby. But the most wonderful thing about it was that you had all the hairy people and the beautiful hippie people, but you also had the Glasgow people who had been to the dance and had been out for a drink. They all like, hey, mob, you know. And they mixed brilliantly, and nobody could ask you outside for a smack in the mouth because you couldn't get outside. You had to wait for the lift, you know. Back again. We were doing a sort of gypsy vaudeville jug band uh, Celtic mixture, and then we started writing songs vaguely in that vein. I was uh, actually working in an accountant's office, and um, very kind of straight, and living with my parents, and uh, playing in rock bands. <laughs> and uh, Robin was really a fully fledged beatnik at that time, so it was like he, he introduced me to that kind of world of whitewashed rooms and strings of garlic and books of Jack Kerouac on the table, that kind of stuff. And so it was the, he kind of uh, interested me in a lot of kind of artistic things like that that uh, hadn't really touched me in the rock scene or in the accountant's office. <laughs> I'll sing you this October song I never wrote a song before it the words and tune are none of my own But my joys and sorrows only Joe Boyd, then a producer for Electra, heard of this sensational young band and turned up at the club the very night the police closed it as a fire hazard. They met up at the house the band were living in outside Glasgow. They had an incredible Sunday afternoon there and Mike and Robin and Clive played me a lot of songs. And they gave me a tape, which they'd made, which I took back to London, and I played it to Jack Holtzman, who was the president of Electra. And when he heard October's song, it sort of knocked him back a bit. And he said, hmm, that's quite a good song. And so I got the green light to do a record as long as it didn't cost more than, I think, 150 pounds. Beside the sea. In the still of evening. It was all live, basically. I don't think we did any overdubs or very, very few. It was just we just performed the songs and recorded them. And the songs, I just loved the songs. It was just like eating candy, you know, to to mix it, to record it. It was just everyone was was juicy and rich and just full of great lyrics and great singing and harmonies and everything. So that was just fun to do. After the first record, um, Clive went to Afghanistan, and I thought I'd always wanted to go to Morocco, so I'll go, you know. So we went to Morocco, and I got a variety of instruments there. I intended never to return to Britain, really. Uh, I intended to stay there, and I, mean, I had this idea that I would stay there in some sort of garden under a tree somewhere and study Arabic. That's about as, as clear as I'd got my plan for life, really, was sit under a tree somewhere and uh, study Arabic flute. I thought that sounded like a great idea, and why not have a go? So I set off to Fez and uh, did just that. Love the Robin returned to pick up again with the ISB. Clive didn't, preferring more traditional folk to the new psychedelic folk rock that Mike and Robin were starting to create. The duo became a trio again when Licorice McKechnie, Licky, joined the band. Soon after, it became a quartet when Rose Simpson joined, appearing on stage with them soon after tuning in turning on and dropping out of university. Suddenly this vision appeared in the refectory, I think it was breakfast time, and this, this walked in, and I mean, everyone sort of, ah, and it was Robin, uh, in full sort of flower power, you know, floating through the refectory, sort of incense smells and things dangling and floating, and, and uh, <laughs> I didn't really have anything that could possibly dress up in. 
to, to go along with what she looked like, you know. The only thing I had was a dressing gown, which I got in a jumble sale in Harrogate, which was actually very handy because it was one of those sort of Indian print things, you know. So I actually did go down to London on the train in my dressing gown. Uh, <laughs> it's the only thing I can think of at the time. It looked all right, you know, it looked quite normal for the time, really. It was really more in the sense of, uh, of friendship rather than, than high high degrees of musical ability. One obviously could have hired a, you know, a, a, a couple of musicians or got together with some musicians that were just musicians, but they had, the notion was it to do it in a kind of a friendly, sort of relaxed sort of way. And somewhere in my mind there is a painting box. Licorice was always on the road with us. She had this quirky voice that both of them liked. As she became more involved and started playing percussion and things, I think Mike didn't like the idea in a way of being outnumbered. Uh, Rose told me that, you know, Mike came home one day after Robin and Basie said, Licorice is going to come on stage on the next tour and be part of the group on stage. You know, Mike came home with a bass and shoved it in Rose's hand and said, learn this. <laughs> it was like being landed on Mars. I mean, for me, it was literally about, I didn't know any of the people. I had never met people like this. I didn't know what on earth anything was about it. And so you just, you know, bumble along, and, you know, smile and say hello and do whatever comes to hand. And if someone gives you something, you, you know, ring it or hit it or <laughs> whatever seems the right thing to do with it and um, just go along with it, really. Oh, they understood that you'd leave when your ship come by. And I fully understood I can't say, oh, I'm, I'm only influenced by my kind of Abyssinian music because of, you know, I listened to an LP of that or something. And I'm not influenced by all the pop music I hear on the wireless when I happen to be sitting in a cafe and there's mm. something I play. Or, or, you know, everything that you hear gets in there somewhere. Sometimes songs are, are about things that have happened to you. And sometimes uh, songs are about things that you would like to make happen or like to see happen or they're they're fantasy songs that you make up. Or else they're songs that just kind of visit themselves upon you like dreams. My cave was bright with sulky gems. I gave the stars like diadems. Silver lost, buried gold. Such was my home in days of Such was my... There's something extraordinary when you're from my background of listening to these extraordinary lyrics about he, people being stabbed with a sword of willow and it was just what you know what and and, and robin saying then was just to die for from incredible depths to incredible heights and then he always had a lovely lovely sense of comedy you know i hear my mother calling and i must be on my way in the middle of it all he would become music hall and wouldn't take it seriously, and then staggering musicianship, and, but just as a throwaway. In the early days, Mike and Robin used to tear each other's songs to bits. I mean, they, they would be very critical of each other and argue a lot and be very intent on imposing their own stamp on each other's songs. If a Robin song was going to enter the ISB repertoire, by God, Mike was going to make people remember the, 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 the sitar part. And vice versa. And there was a very, very healthy level of competitiveness, I always felt, 